Hello everyone, in the last video you will have seen the fact that my Evora is now sporting a beautiful pair of Cobra carbon fibre seats. As I was at the factory to collect those, I decided to have a little sit down with the company's MD, Mark Dunsford, and get a sneak peek at the factory to see just how they're made. So. Let's hear from the man himself. Yeah, um, Cobra Seats, well, the name comes from my grandfather, was the head coach to him at AC Cars in Thames Ditton. Uh, served his lifelong career there. Uh, he was responsible for all of the interior trim, managed the trim shop. Uh, my father started um, work as an apprentice with my grandfather. Um, wasn't there for long because he got him into a lot of trouble and uh, was, was swiftly moved on to other things. Um, but he learned his craft there and went to work for Motolita steering wheels. Uh, spent some time there um, and then decided to, to go it alone, make his own seats back in 1975. Um, we were working out of a, well, my father was working out of a shed in Cambly. Um, and uh, in those days, um, the only other guys that were doing it were Corbo Seats and Paddy Hopkirk. Um, they all sort of knew each other. Um, a guy called Gordon Spice uh, gave my father an order that he couldn't cope with out of his shed in Cambly. So we moved here to Telford because um, it was cheap, uh, needed a big factory. Um, so we came here when Telford was a new town and um, uh, never looked back really. So we, we, still, we stayed in Shropshire and uh, the, the company's been here for 38 years now. Um, I came into the business in 1989 and I took over on my own in 1999. So I've been here yeah, 28 years now. So Yeah, well I can remember before I even started work here, we were making something like 35,000 seats a year in those days, but they were really cheap. Uh, bucket seats. We had the, the first ever uh, volume seller was something called the SFY, um, hence the number plates that you see around the place with that um, connotation. It was just the, the first seat with the, that we made in volume. Um, and that seat, uh, was we were selling by the thousands to Scandinavia for all sorts of applications. Um, uh, and they were going into marine environments, all sorts of things. Um, but years gone by, a seat was a seat. Um, it, it was tested to Regulation 17, which still exists these days, uh, that goes back to an old UN directive back in the early 60s, uh, which meant that there was very little um, testing that you had to do to, to get a seat past a strength test. Um, we did those things, even back in those days. We worked with Myra and had all our seats tested. Um, and um, But you just had four bolts to, to change. A seat went into a car. There were very few safety features, such as airbags, um, very, seats, very few seats even reclined in those days. So to change a typical car seat to a sports seat was very easy. Uh, it was very cheap to do. So the market was hugely buoyant. And um, we, yeah, thousands of seats were going out uh, every week, but they were, um, they were very cheap. Um, and um, and it, was, it was a cracking business at the time. Um, as the years have passed, uh, you start to, to wonder where your future lies because if we, if we scroll forward 30 years or more, um, seats now have airbags, smart occupancy sensors, which can detect whether it's a child or a sack of potatoes to, for the airbag to fire off on the passenger side. Um, uh, pyrotechnics to, to actually fire off the uh, seatbelt um, pretensioners. So there's a lot of things now involved in seats that make it difficult for us to actually change them. Having said that, we've moved with the time. So um, we actually have our own range of seats that we've actually fully type approved specifically for clients. So we're aware of the regulations such as 14, 16 and 17, which re relate to seat back strength tests, uh, seat back anchorage tests, pull tests. And we have actually covered a lot of that. Um, but that makes it infinitely more difficult now to say, okay, well, we can make a seat and fit it into that vehicle instantly because without full type approval or acknowledging all of the aspects of full type approval for safety, it's very difficult to morally sell a seat to somebody and just leave them to fit it. So the business has changed hugely over the years um, and for that reason. Um, but your vehicle, if this is a good time to talk about it, yeah, your vehicle um, in particular, we've been very lucky because um, it's been designed very well and very cleanly and we've been able to maintain all of the original sliders, um, all of the safety aspects. So in terms of seatbelt anchorages, they're all the original seat belts. The seats that we've got in, we've managed to get the H point, which is the theoretical R point, uh, very close to the original seat. So all of your line of sight work. So the Evora has been a perfect car for us to actually say, yes, we now do a system for that, that um, vehicle. Um, if we looked at something like a, a modern BMW that's got a number of sensors built into the seats, it's very, very difficult nowadays to change that without trying to retain all of the architecture that was relevant to the 
regulations 14, 16 and 17 for that vehicle. So uh, yeah, it's, um, the business has had to change dramatically. Going back to the volumes, we don't make it anywhere near that type of volume of seats any longer. Um, typically, we're sending out about eleven or 12,000 seats a year, but they're a completely different seat to what we used to make. So the old SFY, I can remember we actually used to invoice those out of here at £27.50 each. And uh, that was, you know, you used to look at it and think, Phew, you know, that, that's, that's quite a bit of money in those days. Um, but now a typical value of a seat that goes out of here, um, retail cost on, on, on your system, for instance, is, is north of £5,000 for those two seats. Um, the, the aspect of the business that's changed the most is actually the motorsport um, side of things because we've learned a lot over the years in um, road seats um, in how to produce something that's comfortable and safe. The natural progression was into motorsport. Some seat manufacturers have a motorsport background. Um, us, we don't have a motorsport background. What we've got now is we've, we, we've learned um, over the years of working very closely with motorsport. So we're equally as... Um, as capable, uh, we just don't have somebody heading up the, the, the business who's a racing driver. Um, I've now taken my race license for that very reason, because it's a bit embarrassing when people say, so you race yourself? No, I don't, but I make the very thing that saves your life when you have a bad crash one day on a race circuit. Um, but we've, we've really, really worked hard to, to get good at what we do. And that is the core skill of the business, you know, and, and, and that's what drives the business forward. So it's now the lifeblood of everything we do. But motorsport, actually, because it's at the forefront of technology in terms of the materials we use, the production techniques, um, it actually feeds through to everything else we do, which is really interesting because we can take um, certain elements. A, a classic example, we've got a, a contract at the moment to produce seats for vans, um, a commercial vehicle where light weight is, is critical because of the emissions and the payload. And some of the materials that we've learned, there's some really high yield steels that are out in the marketplace now that we've we found they're quite difficult to find, but when we found them and used them for motorsport, we thought, wow, this has got a really good actual um, uh, commercial aspect that we can, we can take for other elements of the business. So motorsport's really important for us because it helps drive the rest of the business. Traditionally, we've been tubular steel manufacturer. Um, we are vertically integrated in-house and we've got all our own engineering facilities, um, but Composites has really been the, the forefront of, of motorsport technology over recent years. Um, we've gone from um, typical hand laid GRP composites, uh, which is where they, they first started out, um, through Kevlar and aramidic reinforcements um, to pre pregs. We've gone from polyester to epoxy resins. Uh, we're now at a point where we've gone beyond almost the autoclave pre preg systems, where you've got the epoxy resins, and we're now looking at closed tool molding. Um, and composites, they're, they're, they're constantly evolving. Um, there's a, 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 a particular type of method of molding at the moment that we're doing a lot of research with, which is an older method of molding, but utilizing some really new advanced materials. And, and, and it's, there's some very exciting opportunities there from a both a cost performance and weight perspective. Um, so I'd, I would say that um, the biggest change we've seen in materials have been through composites um, and the integration of composites into typical seats such as the one we're sat in now. Um, the Mizano's got a composite backrest combined with a steel frame seat. So you've got the traditional strength and rigidity of a steel seat, but we managed to take out a lot of weight. Um, impressively, that seat actually meets the R17 um, forward and rearward moment strength test. And, and at the time, I remember putting it through the test with Myra and thinking, you know, it's got, there's got to be some weak points with this seat. So we asked them, instead of doing the central test, to actually apply the pressure on either side of the seat and measure the deflection. And they said that they, the results came back and they said there was no real point. There was no discernible deflection, which was really actually quite a, a feather in our cap because um, a lot of the seat design in those days wasn't CAD orientated. We had no finite element analysis. Um, we just we did everything not by the seat of our pants, but by a gut feel. And so to actually um, produce stuff like that, um, it's quite an achievement really for us. If somebody comes to me as a customer with a design brief, that would be how we would start. So typically we'd say to, if it was a vehicle manufacturer, okay, where's your R point, which is your H point of a 50th percentile uh, or hybrid dummy. Um, and you'll, you'll drop that in and you'll start working around that. And we've got what we call packaging, which is the cockpit, cockpit of the vehicle. Um, and how we're going to fit that seat into the car. So um, initially that would be our, 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 our starting point along with a visual aspect of what do you want the seat to look like. Um, 
if we take the Nagaro, completely different kettle of fish, um, I was actually fed up with the fact that I was getting a bit broad and, and carrying a bit of success ballast. Wanted some nice lightweight sports seats. Really liked um, similar seats out in the marketplace. Um, and a lot of my friends, we were doing track days, um, but we also wanted something that was a nice fast road seat. Um, but trying to combine a motorsport seat um, with day-to-day -day use is inherently difficult, you know, and um, you'll appreciate this. Years ago, I had a, a Lotus Elise 111S. And um, if I had the, the merest hint of a bad back, I would have to roll out onto the car park before I could then stand up, dust myself down and go to work. So, you know, I started to get a bit frustrated with difficult things to get in and out of. Um, and the Nagaro, uh, a lot of my friends were all sort of getting to the age of 50 and, and um, they said, oh, you know, we really want a seat, something akin to the, the BMW M3 S CSL, the uh, Aston Martin DBS, you know, something like that that's easy to get in and out of, still use a lap and diagonal belt. And I said, you know what? I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the best race seat we've got, which at the time we felt was a combination of the Suzuka and the Imola. We scanned it digitally and then we said, okay, what don't we like about it for use day to day? And what do we like about it that works well on track, but then prevents us from getting in and out day to day? You know, when you nip to the co-op and grab your sandwich at lunchtime, you don't want to be fighting with a load of harnesses and, and rolling out of the car. And, um, and we, we had a bit of a committee made up of a, a lot of people that, that drive some really nice cars. And we, we kept scanning the thing in, drawing it in CAD, and then sending out third angle projections and sort of letting people do spinny spinny, we call it. And we've got a, a software, SolidWorks, which you've got e-drawings. There's an application on a, on a mobile phone, um, so you can pick up an app. And then you can just sit and roll this, this picture of this seat around. And then I get my friends to sort of feed back to me what they felt. And we'd get to the point where we'd all got a, a, a common theme of what we liked and what we didn't like. And at that point we said, okay, we'll make one. So we machined one out of a soft um, modeling foam, took a splash from it, put some foam on it and said, how does that feel? And there was a, a couple of changes we made at that point. Um, and then we actually just said, let's go for it. Let's make the seat. So we made a carbon fiber version to start with, with a, a hugely expensive carbon fiber mold tool. And luckily it was perfect. And that seems to have been um, sort of the story of, around some of the designs of, 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 of seats that we've got. Um, it's, it's, it's moved on from there because we looked at the Nagaro and then said, okay, we don't really like the, the styling aspect on the back, so let's smooth this bit off, change this, tilt the head forward a little bit more. And it, it, generally those things morph over a few years of looking at the seat because the Nagaro is three years old now and, and it's still termed our new seat. But it tends to be a three-year cycle from when you first gestate and, 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 and that design's born. It takes about three years to get to a point where you go, actually, it's nice, we've got it working, we've got it really just licked, you know, and then and then guys like you say, actually, that seat's nice, I like it, just as it is, you know, so it takes a while to get there. Um, but that's how we do it nowadays. A little anecdotal story for you is this one in particular, um, this goes back, this, this seat's now probably 12 years old. I remember spending one Christmas, I was bored between Christmas and New Year, I hand made the part pattern for that out of MDF and body filler until I just cut the back of a race seat off and I sat sanding it down till I got something that I liked and then handed it to our model maker and said, can you make that symmetrical? And that's how that seat was born. So it, it, it is something that you sort of, you live with and, and breathe for 28 years. You, you, you tend to know what to look for in a seat and you know what inherently looks right and looks wrong. This seat in particular, I say, is 12 years old. Um, we did a SWOT analysis of our range um, quite a few years ago now, um, and we've got an original seat called the SFX, which was our classic seat. We were selling a lot into Japan for a heritage market. Um, we, at that point, we thought, Do you know what, that, that's had its time. We're going to write that one off. We're still selling it even now. There's a, there's a container waiting out in the back of the factory to go to Japan with that same seat on. And we still, one of our most successful UK customers buys it still for the classic mini market. So it's very difficult to tell what kind of lifespan a seat has. But typically, um, yeah, I'd say at least 10 years because when you get it right, and you've, it, 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 it's a lot of it's about ergonomics, styling, visually, we can change seats and we can do some really funky things with them and it's very easy to do that particularly with the facilities we've got but once you've got something ergonomically right it's a real recipe for success and you just stick with it for as long as you can. Uh, the one thing I would say is that we're probably the only company out there that exclusively makes seats so that's all we've ever done so and um, there's a number of competitors out there uh, you've got a big brigade of Italian 
competitors. Um, you've got the Germans, which is Recaro, of course. Um, I like and Recaro. I think they're the, the pinnacle of the market, um, and I, I've always sort of been very, very uh, uh, humbled by what they do. That I think their designs are fabulous. I really do, and, and they're a benchmark for us to aspire to. Having said that, I think we're, we're very close to that now. Um, Recaro have another much broader business, which is a huge automotive market and an aerospace uh, business uh, alongside all of their components. So they're, they're an enormous business that's not just seats, but it is focused around seating. All of the rest of the manufacturers, I would say, uh, they are either motorsport derived and have a huge product range of motorsport parts, um, or they don't actually make all of the seats entirely themselves. Um, and so we do sit in a very unique position because you've seen the factory today. Um, we've got our own engineering shop. We're very vertically integrated in the way that we, we build. So we've got cut and sew facilities. Um, we can produce a seat from start to finish and we're reliant upon nobody other than a raw material supplier for our steel. Admittedly, our composites are made by another company, but they're all made to our own designs and our own layups and constructions. And we do all our own testing. So um, I think what makes us unique is that we stick to what we know we stick to what we're good at and we've only ever made seats and it's what my grandfather did and i think that dna uh, it follows down through the line I mean, we, we, the, the logo's got three dots on there and those represent my grandfather myself sorry my grandfather my father and me and those are the three generations of, of people that have only ever made seats and i think that's you know probably what makes us special. We train from within. Um, we've got a really successful apprenticeship programme. We've got five apprentices with us at the moment, um, one of which was Adam, uh, started with us four years ago. He's now responsible for the CAD, the milling machine, and the, the, the seat surfacing design. So he's come a long way in just that time. Um, all of our upholsterers are trained in-house. My father still comes in from time to time and helps people out with stuff because that's a skill that you never lose, and it, and it is something that takes a lifetime to earn. Um, Machinists, our sewing machinists, all of them are in-house trained um, and uh, some of them, I mean, one of the, the, the things that I pride myself on is that we've got very low staff turnover. So most of my staff have been with me for a long, long time. In fact, some of them predate me. Um, one lady upstairs has been here 31 years and that's Wendy, one of the machinists. So um, you value those skills and you make sure you don't let them go. But yeah, you've got to train everybody from, from the ground up these days. Um, We've got a lot of new technology coming in that's making life simpler. So on the larger contracts, we've got a lot of assembly stuff that just clips together and makes life much easier. You know, we're removing glue from the process. We're removing hand cut and, 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 um, and hand trim parts to try and lessen that. But you will always have that need for that skill set. And yeah, it is, um, it's quite unique. We've just recently, you've probably seen Amazon Grand Tour. We had some really good exposure on that. Um, they, they were great guys. They called us up and they said, look, you know, we're in need of some seats for a very specific application. Um, what have you got? And I said, well, look, I said, it will come down and help you out, to be honest, because we want to be involved. And, um, and one thing led to another and we got to do some great stuff with those guys and, and got to meet all of the presenters um, had a real giggle and um, the, we got fantastic coverage as a result. Um, you'll see us in th two thirds of the, the BTCC field. Um, as of last year, they upgraded to an 8862 seat and um, we worked particularly hard to, to, to take care of the driver's requirements. So I spend most of my time at BTCC meetings around the country throughout the summer, making sure that we're supporting the drivers. So you'll see a lot of us there. Um, you will see Cobra seats in pretty much every Premiership stadium throughout the, uh, the UK um, because we're in the dugouts. Um, that's another big chunk of our business. You won't see the Cobra brand because what we do is create a revenue stream for the clubs by actually providing a platform for their sponsors. So a lot of those you see Chelsea, Man United, Man City, um, they're all our seats in those dugouts. Um, and and that's, that's a really good fun bit of the business as well. Um, you will see our products in some really strange places as well. Um, I, I, I go to um, uh, pop concerts and you'll see, I say that sounds really old fashioned, doesn't it? But I have been to concerts where I've seen guys in the lighting gantry sat in one of our bucket seats, um, pointing the spotlight, you know. Um, amazing places that you just spot them and you think, oh, I never thought of that use, you know. Custom embroidery for people now in motorsport is a really nice um, feature. Uh, it, it, it gives the, the, the drivers a sense of ownership of their safety equipment rather than just viewing it as something that's for safety's sake. Um, it's also a good platform to, to air their sponsors um, and um, it, it also shows that there's that personal touch behind everything that we do. So, and we do a lot of that now, a heck of a lot of that. Um, 
it's 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 hard i know i moan about the place and we all moan about a lot in life and it's hard work you know but yeah this is a hell of an achievement and i'm carrying it on on behalf of my dad you know and that's a a, a really um yeah I'm, I'm very proud of the people the people that work here as well you know i'm nothing without them and they are a good team and um we are uh, in in rather a, a a growth stage at the moment with some, with some new contracts that we've got going um, we've also just patented a new marine suspension seat, so that's a completely new market for me. I'm working on that with a with a um, another party that's uh, um, particularly experienced in that field. So um, I'm looking forward to being stuck on boats in all sorts of weathers <laughs> doing testing. So, uh, but yeah, that'll be good fun. Um, I, you know, it will certainly be around for a long time to come. Don't really know um, if we'll change that much because, as I say, we just enjoy what we do. So. Uh,